Let's take our seats. Um, it is such a joy and a privilege to be uh, with you this weekend, to have been able to fly here from where I live in Manchester in England. And it's always a wrench to leave home, especially because I have an eight week old baby girl at my house now. Precious gift from God. But uh, I was just saying to my friend Zach, he was asking me when I was going home, and I said, I'm going home tomorrow evening. He said, are you looking forward to going home? I said, of course. Forward to getting back to my girls, to my precious family. But I can't lose, because when I come here, I get to be with my precious family. So it's good. And when I leave here, I get to go back to my precious family. So it's good. God is good. And we've been blessed over these last two days, haven't we? God's kindness and a, a massive thanks again to all of the groups and organizations and leaders and individuals who have partnered and collaborated together to make these two days happen. It's a precious, precious thing to be able to gather together like this. Of course, we gather regularly in our individual church communities, making up the total global church family of which we are all a part of regularly. We do that regularly, but this is a special time for those of us who have an evangelistic motivation and imperative, and those of us who just can't shake the gospel from our bones, perhaps because God has called us to be evangelists, or perhaps simply because we've truly understood what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, is to be his ambassadors into the world. And with that compulsion ringing, in our ears, in our minds, in our hearts, in our psyches, in our souls, we see an opportunity like this and we want to gather together and be together that we might be equipped, encouraged, and only by the Holy Spirit empowered to go for the glory of God. Because my friends, if not us, then who? Only Jesus' people can carry Jesus into the world. Which is why it's a tragedy that so many Jesus' people don't carry Jesus into the world. We've heard some thinking around that over the last few days, and our job is not to judge or condemn, it's not to twist people's arms, it's to continually refocus people's eyes on the glory and the wonder of the cross and the one who hung there for our sin and iniquity, who bore it upon himself that we might be restored to that which God created us for relationship with him, holy God. It's a great honor for me to have this final session. My advice to you guys at the back would be to turn the clock on now, because if there's no clock on, we'd be here till tomorrow, I'll miss my flight, it'd be a disaster. So let's get that clock on, I'll stick to nine minutes. Come on, behave yourselves. <laughs> I'm definitely ignoring you if it's nine minutes. But um, it's a real honor for me to, to share with you today, and um, I won't tell you too much of my story or, 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 or what's going on in my ministry. You've heard a little bit about that. And actually, I've even made a boo-boo straight away because it's not my ministry, it's the Lord's. Amen. We don't have a ministry. God does, and we partner with Him in it. It belongs to Him alone. And when we get our mind right about that, we can view it in the correct and proper way. That everything we do is in submission and service to the King of Kings. It doesn't belong to me. I belong to Jesus. That's an important distinction. So it's a great honor for me to be here, but I, I don't want to spend uh, time talking about those things. Please come talk to me afterwards if you want to know about that. I want to get into the Word because I have a big responsibility here as we uh, spend these last few moments together and draw to a point of commissioning and sending for all the equipping and empowering that we're going to do of our people and our, uh, our brothers and sisters out there who need to hear what we're hearing in here, but they're going to hear it through you. And you're going to mobilize them to go. Um, and the responsibility that I have this afternoon is not to do the final talk per se. The responsibility that I have, and it's a big one and it's a difficult one, is to not get in the way of what God is doing. It's very easy for us to get in the way of what the Lord is doing. And there's different personality types. And some people have very big personalities. That's wonderful. Big, exuberant personalities can tell a great joke, can tell a great story, but then, woo, tickle, 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 they're making us laugh, and then slap, they give us some gospel truth. That's a wonderful thing to be able to do if you're gifted in that way. 
Other people are a little bit more gentle in their tone and, and in the speed of their speech. And it doesn't matter whether you're the big exuberant or the slightly more contained. God is not primarily interested in your personality type. He's simply interested in the posture of your heart. Posture that you will adopt before him to say, Lord, I don't really have anything of use to you. All I have is the one thing that you're asking for, which is my life. So I'll give you that and see what you can do. So in the next few moments, as we turn to the Word of God, we're going to explore a little bit more what it looks for us to give our lives to Jesus and see what He does with us, whether extroverted or introverted, whether we can turn a phrase like no other, or whether we stutter when we speak, just like it seems that Moses did when God called him to speak to the Pharaoh and demand that the captives be set free. Me? Don't use me. I can't speak. Properly, what does the Bible say when Moses responded that way? That God burned with anger. Because every time we say, me? No, 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 God, I'm not good enough. What we're really saying is, God, you're not good to use me. But God knows what he's doing. He doesn't make mistakes. We just need to get into alignment with what he's doing and serve him faithfully. Turn with me, if you will, to Luke chapter 9, verse 28. Luke chapter 9, verse 28. We've had a, a great time together. Some beautiful experiences. I've been seeing people being prayed for outside. In fact, there's people being prayed for at the back right now. It's a beautiful picture. That even during the sessions, it's not just what happens here. It's what can happen outside. And God is not constrained to what happens from the front. I don't care if you suddenly feel like you have a need to stop listening to me and go and pray for something. Go as the Lord needs. That's fine. You're not captive to the stage. We're captive to the one who saves. And as I've been seeing people being prayed for and, and I've, I've, I've listened to the songs being sung and presented myself before the Lord. And, and hey, sometimes we all have these experiences. You're singing songs and it feels great. And other times you're singing songs, you're not really feeling anything. It doesn't matter what you feel. What matters is what you bring of yourself. You bring yourself to it. And as you bring yourself, God will meet you in it. And just like Tamron was saying earlier, so beautifully and eloquently, sometimes it's the goosebumps and that's cool, has its place. And other times it kind of feels cold and it's like there's not much going on, but there's always something going on. See, I am doing a new thing, God says to his prophet Isaiah. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? The problem is not whether God is doing something or not doing something. The problem is, do we have eyes to see what he's doing? If we only ever process through the lens of how I feel about it, you're going to miss a lot of what God is doing. Feelings are good. They're important, but they can also be misleading. If the heart is the throne of our feelings, well, the Bible tells us the heart is deceitful of all things. So maybe our feelings will mislead us from time to time, but God doesn't mislead. God is clear. So maybe God wishes to speak to us beyond our feelings. We are multifaceted people. We have emotion. We have psychology. We have biology. We have community. Crucially, we have the Word of God, which can go into us through the faculties of our intelligence, but it can also hit to the very root of our soul. And if we are not prepared to open every part of ourselves up, then we have not died as God is asking us to die, that we might be reborn as new creations. Not as half and half creations, half of what is new and half of what is old. No, new creations, where the old has gone and the new has come because God is doing a new thing. Do you have eyes to see what he is doing? But we've had a beautiful time here and we've seen God working. And yet when we read this story in Luke 9, 28, what we see is perhaps something that we would love even more than what we've had here, the transfiguration. Wow! A demonstration of glory that I think we would all have loved to have been present for. Let's read about it. Verse 28. About eight days after Jesus said this. Said what? Something that happens earlier in the passage. Don't worry, we'll circle back around to that later. Jesus has been speaking, but now he takes Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. You know what I love about the beginning of this narrative is that straight away we see something beautiful. God loves friendship. God created friendship. He designed friendship that we may be blessed by friendship. In fact, it's at the root of the command that God has given us about what this life is all about. The Shema of Israel, Deuteronomy 6, 
4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. There's already one God. And how do we respond to him? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, strength, and soul. Jesus adds mind to it. The whole personhood, just like I was talking about before. No part of you left reserved. All part of you given over to love, to relationship with God. And then what do you do? Then you love your neighbor as you love yourself. The whole story of the gospel is a story of relationship, or more specifically, about presence. That God has eternally been present with himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Sometimes I'll be talking to people about God's eternal existence and why he created us. People say, hey, do you think God created us because he was bored? You know, during lockdown, my wife and I, we decided to get a dog so we could have something that we could, you know, play with and take on some walks during the COVID days. Because we were a little bit bored and we wanted something to occupy our time and, and love. And he's awesome. I love my dog. But God does not react to us in that way. God is not sitting in the pre creation eternity thinking, well, if only I had something to play with, I'd be fulfilled. Are you crazy? God has been in eternal, perfect fulfillment with himself for all time. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit perfectly fulfilled. This is good news, my friends, because it means we were not created out of lack. We were created out of perfect fulfillment. Which means that in him we can be fulfilled. And so God puts us into this world that is good. And in the creation story, he's making a lot of things that he thinks are pretty good. But then he arrives at something that he says is not good. Wait, not good before the fall? We thought that only the not good stuff happened after Adam and Eve sinned. No, 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 no. Read your Bible. Genesis. Right at the beginning. What does it say? He's creating things. They're good. They're good. They're good. And then we arrive at something that's not good. What is it? It is not good that man should be alone. Aloneness is not a good thing. God has never been alone. We were not created to be alone. Relationship, friendship is everything. But through our rebellion against God by choosing to believe that we're a better king than God is, that we could know how to live our lives far better than he ever could, that the vision that we have for our lives is grander and better and sweeter and more fulfilling than any vision that God could come up with, thank you very much, crunch, and before you know it, where there was goodness, there is now darkness. Where there was life, there is now death. Where there was peace, there is now chaos. Where there was hope, there is now only despair. And what is the thing that God says when he comes in? Into the garden, after Adam and Eve have rebelled and rejected the King of Kings, this perfect relationship, the one thing we were created for is now no longer possible because of our stupidity. And what does God do? Does he barrel into the garden going, You stupid people! What have you done? No, he's going to get to the question of what have you done. But what's the first thing that he asks? Where are you? Because we've separated ourselves from what we were created for. Relationship. Friendship. Is it any wonder then that as Jesus comes into the world to minister, to live the perfect life that we were all created to live but rejected, so he comes to show us how we should have done it all along. Is it any wonder that a key, crucial part of that perfect life was friendship? with other people. And he takes his friends, Peter, John, and James, up a mountain. In fact, he takes them around quite a few places. You know, this world is facing a pandemic. We've had the COVID one, we still have some legacy stuff from that. I know it's still tricky in certain parts of the world, COVID. We're kind of little by little figuring that one out medically. But there's a big old pandemic in the world that's far worse than COVID. And we don't seem to be able to figure this one out so easily. And it's the pandemic of loneliness. This world is gripped by loneliness. We're more connected than we've ever been before. If you sat in Nick Parker's session yesterday about um, digital evangelism, he was talking about this idea that we're connected more than ever before. When I go back to Manchester tomorrow, we can still talk. If we exchange WhatsApp numbers, no problem. Easy connection. And yet, all of the statistics show us, all of the research, all of the social 
social dynamics, the psychological profiling shows us that we are at our lowest ebb in terms of relational fidelity that we've ever had. We are disconnected. We don't know how to have meaningful relationships. We have become so obsessed with ourselves, so obsessed with discovering who we are, that we've missed the reality that you will never know who you are until you know whose you are. And in knowing whose you are and discovering who you are, realizing that you can then live in community with others in such a way that brings a fulfillment to the world that it craves and was created for, but will never find but through faith in Jesus Christ that then develops into Christian community. Friendship is at the heart of everything. Friendship is at the heart of evangelism. Look at any social study around evangelism, it'll tell you the same thing. The highest factors of success in evangelism are related to friendship. Michael Cassidy yesterday in his session was uh, getting us to raise our hands who was led to Christ through a, a friend or a family member. Relationship is so important to evangelism. Of course, gospel campaigns, big festival evangelism, it can work and have wonderful fruitfulness. And I endorse it and I'm thankful for it. And I say, go for it as the Lord leads. Wonderful. But the truth of the matter is, we know full well that the most effective form of evangelism, hands down, easily, not even close, is forming friendships with people that allow Christ to come into the midst of hopelessness and despair through compassion and love and reveal something profound and long-lasting and meaningful. So here is Jesus with his friends and he's taking them up the mountaintop and he's going to do what he does a lot, which is pray. Prayer, other than the tenets of the good news itself, the plain truth of the gospel, prayer is the bedrock of evangelism. Because as we've heard so many times over the last two days, we can't save anybody. The power of salvation belongs to God alone. So we put the power where the power belongs. And of course, we pray personally for ourselves. We pray for confession. Lord, I've messed up here. I need to come before you. I need to confess. I need to repent. I need to acknowledge you as God and me as your subjects, your friend, your child, but the one for whom you came to die because I am messy. We pray for supplication for the things that we need. God, I, I feel like I need this or I need this. And, and sometimes God gives us those things because they do indeed match up with what he knows is good for us. And sometimes we don't receive what we pray for because we're not praying the things of God, praying the things of man. And you should be thankful that God doesn't give you the things that you pray when you pray the things of man. Because this world is full of the things of man and it doesn't look very good, does it? God isn't going to give you the things of man, it's going to give you the things of heaven. So if you pray things of heaven, guess what? You'll receive it. Wow, that's good. But God knows what he's doing. You can trust him with your prayers. We pray for maturity. God, will you refine me? Will you mature me? Will you move me to a new place? Because I'm thankful that I'm not what I was, but I also know that I'm not yet what I should be. So will you take me from glory to glory, from mercy to mercy, refining me, creating me an increasingly large and new kingdom heart because I want to be more like you. So these are things that we can pray in so many more, but of course we then pray externally for the world. Oh, Lord, would you soften the hearts of those that I'm going to talk to today? Lord, would you give me opportunities? Here's an interesting thing about praying for opportunity. In my experience, and I think it's a gut instinct more than anything else, when you pray for opportunities, I don't think God actually gives you opportunities. I think he just opens your eyes to what was already there in the first place. Because he's doing a new thing. Do you have eyes to see? Pray that you'd have eyes to see. And see what he does as he opens your eyes. So we pray, we pray, we pray, we follow the lead of our master. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed. Prayer is transformative. The spirit is transformative. We do not remain the same when we enter into the presence of God. God changes his people. His clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah appeared in glorious splendor. How often do we try to manufacture glorious splendor? Hey, I wonder if I, uh, I can afford to buy that fancy looking suit over there, or maybe buy a little bit more bling 
or maybe upscale my car a little bit, or get some nice fancy new shoes, or I don't know what it would be that aesthetically and outwardly will help me to arrive wherever I go with glorious splendor. But my friends, you can't manufacture glorious splendor. There's only one way that glorious splendor will be revealed through you. It's if you have the Spirit of God in you, who is the only one that carries glory into this world, and he does it through his people. Here, two of God's people appear on the scene. Very surprising. Very surprising all of a sudden that Elijah and Moses appear. Now, what's the Bible doing here? What's God doing here in this story? There's nothing arbitrary in the Bible. There's nothing that's there just incidentally. God is always telling a story, and it's a new story. Oh, it might be related to the old, because God loves to draw from what has gone before. The past matters. The past informs us about our present, but if we get trapped into the past, we will not have eyes to see how God is taking the past, turning it to something new, and bringing glory for the future. So, we see that there's a little past dynamic, as Elijah and Moses are from the past, but we also recognize that maybe God is trying to show us something new. What do Elijah and Moses represent? Well. Moses represents the law. I mean, he literally went up onto Mount Sinai and he got those stone tablets and he brought them down and he gave the Ten Commandments to the people of God. He is the Old Testament representation in a person of the law of God. And here he is on the mountaintop. And then there's another person, Elijah. Perhaps, now, you could get into arguments about this one and I don't want to argue with anybody. Unless it's about soccer, we can argue about that. But perhaps Elijah, perhaps the greatest of all the prophets. But whether he is or what he is, he's certainly there as a representation of what a prophet is to represent, which is what in the Old Testament? The Word of God. So Jesus is here, stood on the mountaintop, and it's glorious, and it's amazing, and it's wonderful, and there are a beautiful representation of two key elements that we need to understand. The law of God, and the Word of God. Wow! Except there's something even better on the mountaintop. Jesus. You want to come preach this sermon? You're ahead of me, my friend. <laughs> I love it. Jesus, who, guess what? Is the fulfillment of the law. Amen. And is the truth. The word of God himself. The logos come to earth. Jesus is meeting with his forerunners. Those who were giving testimony to the story that God has been writing since the day that we made a catastrophic mistake to reject relationship in favor of our own kingdom. And here on the mountaintop, we are being drawn into an eternal story. And God is saying, hey, do you see that I'm doing something new? I wonder if you have eyes to perceive it. Now, we would love to be in this experience. Raise your hand if you would have loved to have been on that mountaintop. I would have loved to have been there for the experience, but not for the walk up the mountain, because I hate hiking. It's the worst thing in the world. But, yeah, amen. But to be on the mountaintop in the presence and the glory of this wonderful thing, well, who wouldn't want to be there? And, of course, as we look at the text, we can see that the disciples, they were so excited they couldn't believe what was going on. Look at what happens in the very next verse. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring for, uh, to fulfillment in Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were so excited. No, wait. Were very sleepy. Ah. Oh. That wasn't what I was expecting to read. Sometimes, I think, that we expect if we can just manifest enough of the glory of God, people will wake up. I don't think that's the case. Because here the disciples are in the presence of a glorious, splendorous moment. And they are half asleep. They have missed that not only are Elijah and Moses there as a visual representation of the story that God is telling, but they have now given words to the story that God is telling. They spoke about his departure. What are they talking about? Talking about the passion. They're talking 
about what Jesus is going to go on to do for the sins of the world, to the glory of the Father. They are talking about the good news. They're having a gospel conversation. Wow! How many times are you having gospel conversations in your church and it feels glorious but half the people are asleep? Hmm. Take heart, my friends. Jesus had the same problem. How do you wake people up from their slumber? You're patient with them. You're gentle. You're gracious. And you keep doing what you're doing, which is seeking the glory of the Father and going in the glory of the Father. And little by little, people will begin to open their eyes. And it may take some longer than others. But people will begin to open their eyes. And they will begin to see. And at first they might not understand. So again, be patient with them. So many of the problems that we have in evangelism as evangelists is that we're so keen to go. And we want everyone to come with us. But we blaze a trail. And we actually intimidate people. And we make people apathetic about the gospel. Because they either think they're not qualified to do it. Because we clearly are. Because look at how far we can run. Look at our glorious splendor. They suddenly mistake what God is doing in our lives for the things that we actually can do in our own strength, which is nonsense. We can't do nothing. But that which is done through him. Or we make people think that we've got it covered. So we try to show a manifestation of the glory of heaven, but actually all we do is leave people thinking we've got it covered. But we don't got it covered. God has, but he invites all of his people to be part of what he is doing in the world, to open their eyes. So evangelists in the room, please commit with me to one beautiful trait. In fact, it's a fruit of the Spirit, and the fruits of the Spirit are not plural with an S on the end, not nine separate aspects. It's one fruit of the Spirit with nine virtues. And what's one of those virtues? Patience. We've got to be patient evangelists. I know we've got to go and get the good news into the world and we want to go with vigor. We've got to be patient with our own people. We love them. Don't twist people's arms into serving the laws. We love them into it. So Peter and his uh, companions were very sleepy. But when they became fully awake, I don't know how long it took, but they got there eventually. When they became fully awake, they saw his glory. All right, now we're in business. They saw his glory. Okay, let's see what happens here. We should be on track now. And the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, as Moses and Elijah are going the way that they went, I don't know whether they ascended, I don't know whether they walked down the mountain and then disappeared. Who knows how it happened, but they're leaving. Peter says to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Wow, that's an understatement. Of course it's good for you to be there, Peter. It's a wonderful, beautiful thing. Is it good for us to be here today? Yes, of course it is. It's wonderful. And so then Peter says this. Hey, you know what we should do? Let's put up three shelters. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. The Bible in brackets says he did not know what he was saying. You know what Peter is saying here? He's saying two hideously wrong things. First of all, he's saying, hey, these two guys, these two forerunners of you, Jesus, they're on an equal footing to you. Let's celebrate you all. No, there's only one Jesus. If there is anybody in your church context, in your ministry context, that you are elevating to the level of Jesus, what on earth are you doing? What on earth are you doing? There is one Jesus. I am nothing. He is everything. I am imperfect. He is perfect. I am unrighteous. He is righteous. I am unholy. He is holy. But here's the beauty. He invites me to undress my mucky, filthy unrighteousness and be clothed in his perfect righteousness. So that when I step into the presence of God at the end of all things and he looks at me and determines on my holy dress code whether I can inherit the kingdom of God, he no longer looks at me and sees all of my sinfulness that would forever exclude me from the perfection of our holy kingdom. Instead, he looks and he sees the perfection of his holy son worn his righteousness on unrighteous Ben and it doesn't totally make sense to me and it's certainly not fair and I definitely don't deserve it but that's that he would clothe me in his righteousness and say, enter in, enter in to your eternal inheritance. 
that we would elevate anything or anyone to the place of Jesus. Lord, we repent. We're going back to the original moment of sin where we think there's anything that can be king other than the king himself. But the second problem that Peter has here is not just misplaced worship, but a misunderstanding of what worship actually is. You know, there's seven biblical words for worship. There's three Hebrew words, there's four Greek words. And the essential ideas that are carried through these precious words that the Bible uses, and in English translations of the Bible are translated as worship, and in the majority of other languages, the majority of those translations will be the localized word for worship, with a few exceptions here and there. But the general concept of what the Bible is expressing when one of those seven biblical words is translated as worship means these three things. It means submission, it means service, and it means reverence. What Peter is doing here is he's saying, hey God! I want to worship you and I think you've provided me something here which is good because he doesn't yet know that Jesus is the God that he's talking to not quite there yet but he'll get there but he's put something on the same line as Jesus because there's confusion about what's going on and he says hey I want to worship and I think this is an amazing opportunity to worship I think this is an amazing moment to worship and I want to erect a shelter that will mean that we can dwell here and enjoy this mountaintop experience. And the temptation for all of us is that we start to idolize the mountaintop. We start to idolize worship more than the one that we worship. We start to crave the experience more than the one that the experience is supposed to draw us into a knowledge of. And instead of Submitting ourselves and serving and being reverent towards the Lord's, we say, Ooh, I wonder what I can get out of this worship experience today. And the Bible says, I'm sorry, you thought this was for you. It isn't. It's for Him. It's always been for him. It will always be for him. The beauty of it and the grace of it is that when we meet him and give him everything that we have, of course we are blessed in return. Of course we receive more than we can ever dare to hope for, but not because it is an expectation that we somehow deserve to get something by giving God his due in worship. And really, we kind of want something for ourselves out of it. No, just because we pour out our lives and say, God, it's all about you. I love you. I need you. You're everything. I want to serve you. I want to submit to you. I want the fear of the Lord to be a real thing in my life. We struggle with that idea. The fear of the Lord. What is the motivation for evangelism? We talked about it a little bit over the last two days. We're very quick to jump to the idea of love being the motivator for evangelism. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14 would agree with you if you think that. For Christ's love compels us. Because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all for, uh, and therefore all died. Wow. In fact, that's God's motivation, surely. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son. Wow! Love is a great motivator. But if we just have eyes to see a little bit more of what Paul is writing in 2 Corinthians, we'll see that there's a dual motivator for our witness. Before we get to the motivation of love in verse 11, it says this. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. We love the idea of love being the motivator for our imaginings. I mean, it's a right idea and a good idea, but it's not the whole story. The whole story is that we reverently, in awe and wonder, stand before God and say, Wow, you are so amazing in your glorious splendor. You are so magnificent. You are so sovereign. You are so much bigger. I am so unworthy and undeserving of ever stepping back into your presence because of my sinfulness. Yet, because of your grace, because of your Son, because of the cross, you have made it possible for me to enter back into relationship, to repent, to change direction like the prodigal son to come to my senses in the pigsty in the lowest of the low and to journey home and realize that the father is meeting me on the road to embrace me and bring me into his loving compassionate embrace but you are so big you are so magnificent 
And even though I want to know your love and love you as you have first loved me, I also need to recognize that you are God and I'm not. And even though I want to celebrate that you are a loving father that draws me into an embrace, you are also the majestic king of kings. And I want to keep both of those things in focus so that I truly know who you are. Worship. Worship. You know, I don't, it's not, the pulpit is not a place to get on a hobby horse, say what you would like to see changed in the church. But in light of what I've been saying here, there is one little thing that I would like to just offer because I think it's important into what we're talking about here. This idea of a time of worship being the band comes up onto the stage. Now let's have a time of worship. We've got to get away from it. It's unhealthy. And it's new, about 50 years old. Talk to anybody in the last 50 years, you say, that was worship today. They would probably, their mind would go to what the music was like. If you ask my grandparents' generation, what was worship like today, they would have a slightly bigger vision, which would be, what was the whole service like? We're going to worship today. They would intend to mean the whole gallery, the prayers, the reading of scripture, the fellowship, the singing, all of those things. But even that's too narrow. Because as we've heard, the biblical vision of worship is nothing less than the total whole surrender of my entire life given over to God in service, submission, and reverence to join with Isaiah as I see the holiness of God and say, woe is me, I am undone, for I am a man of unclean lips and an impure heart, and then to taste the good refining fire of Jesus Christ as he purifies me and cleans me and washes me up and restores me to some I never even believed was possible by his goodness and then I see in God the hope to take back the world for his glory and he says hey my eyes are roaming the earth to see if there's anybody who will go and out of submission service and reverence and love to say here I am I don't got much, just a frail life that you've redeemed by your glory. But if it can be useful to you, Lord, it's yours. We need a new vision of worship. Thankful for the songs, love it. It's so good for us to gather. Worship in terms of music stuff that we sing together is fuel. It fuels us for our evangelism. Here's a question to any worship songwriters in the room. Why are you writing such generic worship songs that could be sung anywhere in the world? I mean, sure, write some of them if you want, but why are you not writing songs for your local community? Why are you not writing songs that name check the local streets, local concerns, local issues? Songs today that represent the kind of psalmistry that comes out of the scriptures. I know it won't travel around the world, it won't become a big famous song, but I tell you what, edify your community. Why do we not sing songs that speak of the glory of what God is doing? day by day in our local community? Why are we not singing songs about salvation through that has just happened that name checks people that have given their lives to Jesus as an acknowledgement that God is at work in our community today. His gospel still works. There is power in the name of Jesus. You know why the church is a little bit fluffy on evangelism? Because we don't sing about the direct glory of what he's doing in our town today. We sing about general eternal truths from scripture which we should absolutely sing. But if that's all we ever see, we will have a concept of what God does, but not a reality of it in our day-to-day -day lives. Songwriters, start writing better songs. And I'll do my best to start preaching better sermons and we'll go together by His grace. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid as they entered the clouds. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son whom I have chosen listen to him you know what the most neglected tool for evangelism is listening <laughs> as evangelists we love to get out there and verbalize and explain and articulate but man we've got to start opening our ears let's start opening our ears to what the lord is saying let's start opening our ears to culture 
I'll start opening our ears to the genuine concerns that people have. We so often think we have really good answers to questions. And we might have good answers to questions. The problem is, a lot of the time, those aren't the questions that people are asking. And we didn't bother to find out. Listen. We don't just listen to people for an information transaction. We listen because when you listen to somebody, you show them that you care about them. You love them. That they are deserving of your attention to be seen, to be known, to be loved which is what everybody desires. In fact, it comes back to the heart of relationship for what you were created for. To be seen, to be known, to be loved by your creator, and to see, and to know, and to love him in return. Well, we blew it. Like, if you can blow anything, we blew it like crazy time. But God, in his mercy, sends his son. To fix a problem that seemed without hope or solution. To bring reconciliation to the world. Going back to 2 Corinthians 5, therefore if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. My friends, you know what our ministry is? Amen. My ministry is not preaching, even though preaching is useful. By God's desire that through the foolishness of our preaching, and let's be honest, most preaching is it's kind of mad that we could communicate to somebody the eternal truths of God but with his spirit and rooted in his truth. But my ministry is not preaching. My ministry is not music. Our ministry is not signs and wonders. Our ministry is not festival or crusade evangelism. Our ministry is not reaching out to the homeless communities or the drug addicts or anything. These are all wonderful things in and of themselves or tools by which the objective can be achieved. But the ministry in and of itself, never forget it, is the ministry of reconciliation as though Christ were making his appeal through us. Not because he needs us. Because he doesn't. It's better than that. He wants us. He wants us because it brings a blessing to us as it glorifies him. And in this moment of commissioning in the band, they can jump up and join me here. In this moment of commissioning as we move now into the final minutes of our time together, and I know Tamron was keen to do some prayer stuff around the Holy Spirit and some of the things she was talking about earlier, and I certainly will invite her to do that in a few moments' time. But before we get to that, I, it might seem like a strange thing to do at the end of a, a time that's been so encouraging and, and a blessing and a bit of a mountaintop experience and all of that, but, but the, the really important thing that we have to remember is this. Mountaintop experiences are wonderful gifts from God, and they always serve a purpose. Because they help us to see God more clearly and from the mountaintop, the promised land more clearly. But the truth of the matter is we don't live on the mountaintop. Oh, we will eternally one day. But today we don't live on the mountaintop. We live on the plain. And actually many times in our lives we live in the valley. You see, my friends, if Jesus Christ had done what Peter wanted and stayed on that mountaintop, had ignored the voice of the Lord, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Why? Because the son is obedient to the father, obedient even to coming down off the mountaintop to the cross. And if we stay on the mountaintop, then we are being disobedient. Because actually, we are to come down off the mountaintop with our Messiah and go to the cross with him. About eight days after Jesus said this, that's how we started. What had Jesus said? He had said this just a few verses earlier. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily 
and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. We are not to live on the mountaintop. We will get there by God's grace eternally. By his grace we have times when we get to go up the mountaintop and see a bit more clearly and experience a bit more fully. And it's wonderful and it fuels us, but the rest of the world is not there. So if we stay there, how will they know? So we come down into the valley. And we die the death of our Saviour. And we are born again into the new that we might live as his ministers of reconciliation. That we might help others ascend the mountaintop that they too may see ever more clearly. And also come and live on the plain and in the valley until such a day as all of God's people will eternally dwell on the mountain of the Most High. On the 3rd of April, 1968, Memphis, Tennessee, the great Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. gave a famous speech, not the big famous speech, but probably his second most famous speech, where he said, and I'm slightly paraphrasing, but we're facing very difficult times, very difficult times ahead, difficult days ahead. But I'm not concerned any longer because I have been to the mountain top and I have seen the promised land. And you know what happened 24 hours later? He was assassinated by an assassin's bullet. I don't know what tomorrow holds for any of us. I don't know if tomorrow you will face financial disaster, health disaster, relationship disaster, challenge in your life that seems overwhelming and almost unbearable were it not for Christ Jesus. But I know that because we get to go up the mountain and we can see that little bit more clearly, that glorious splendor, we have a confident hope that our Messiah is alive, he is good, he is coming again and he is calling us in his power to live in his glory so that the world would know there is hope and his name is Jesus. The only question is what kind of people do we want to be? South Africa, I don't know much about your context, but in talking to people here, know that you're going through some tough times right now as a country in many different areas. And whilst we have compassion for those things, they do not fill our mind with concern. Why? Because we have been to the mountains. And we have seen the promised mountains. And now we need to come onto the plain and into the valley to say, hey, South Africa, Hey, Africa, hey, world, do you not know? Hope has a name. His name is Jesus. Amen. And the way we receive that hope is by repentance. So we're going to have a time of repentance. I started by leading us into that time and went into that other thing, so sorry if that was confused, but I want to draw us into a time where we have an opportunity to repent and show God that we are in awe of Him and recognize our weakness and our frailty. And maybe we could use, yeah, let's use Moses as an example. That's a good one to do. Moses, burning bush, holy ground. Maybe our act of repentance and stepping into the holiness of God will be to take our shoes off today. And as we take our shoes off to say, Lord, I recognize your holiness. What is the ultimate purpose of the gospel? Many would say salvation. It's not correct. The ultimate purpose of the gospel is holiness. That we would be holy as he is holy. Salvation is the mechanism by which that can happen. God is calling a holy people to live a holy life. That the world would see his holiness and inherit his holy kingdom. So I'm going to encourage now as the band begins to play. And they can begin to play behind me. An opportunity for you to repent. And you don't need me to tell you what it is in your life. You know what's on your heart, what's in your mind. For some of you, it may be a very obvious area of sinfulness. For some of you, it might be something quite subtle, actually. How you've been letting what you watch on a news cycle about what's going on in South Africa not just draw you to a place of compassion where you give it to the Lord, but draw you to a place of concern where you actually start to doubt whether there's a way through which God could work. So many subtle ways in which we can be drawn into the old life, but you are a new creation. You have eyes to see what God is doing. 
So if there's anything, any way in which, and don't be embarrassed, don't be shy, don't be like, oh, people think it's weird if I'm repenting because I'm supposed to be a leader. Are you kidding me? Repentance is the daily activity of the true Christian. The daily activity of the true Christian is we recognize we are not as we should be. But by grace, we're not what we were. Now we see in part, then we shall see fully. Thank you that we see a little bit more clearly today, but God, we still need to do some work. Thank you that you're doing that work in us, for us, through us. So Lord Jesus, I pray right now that if anybody in here needs to get right with you as we have this moment of commissioning, I think as Tamara comes and prays over anybody for a true spiritual encounter that perhaps you've not had before, but before we can get there, let's, let's repent. Jesus, lead us now. If that's you, I just ask you to take off your shoes. And then I also ask you to doubly come to the front. And, and let's kneel together at the front. Let's kneel before our King. If you're able, I appreciate it. Maybe not everybody will be able. And this is a hard thing to do because it's public. But do you have the fear of the Lord? Or do you have the fear of man? fear of man leads to death. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and leads to life and life eternal. So Lord, we come before you and repent of our fleshiness, of our sinfulness, of our frailty, of our weakness, of doubting you, of not trusting you, of not being patient, of not letting your spirit work, speaking bad about your church. Whatever it may be, Lord, we submit to you now in Jesus' name.